are imperfect, you are wired for struggle, but you are worthy of love and belonging. Brene Brown. This is B. Jeremani, and you are listening to Miss J. The Renovation. Alexa, how can I be happier? Hmm, I'm not sure. Yeah, me either. Episode 5, Nobody's Perfect. This was a total bait and switch, except I didn't end up behind the wheel of a shitty Acura. Part 1, The Elephant in the Room. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Miss J the Renovation. Thank you so much for coming back and listening. Let's just dive in right away by talking about the elephant in the room. This episode has taken a long damn time. When I first imagined this project, I had imagined 14 books. I thought I can read pretty fast. I'll get through these really quickly. I'll make a few fun, funny episodes where I'm just kind of making fun of these self-help books, and it'll just be a quick project. I thought, you know, I'll start in October or November. At most, I'll be done by February. February for 17 episodes. It's now April and we're working on episode number five. So clearly I misunderstood how much time this project was going to take. And not just how much time it was going to take, but I think I also misunderstood what this project was really about. And I think I was really sort of craving some actual change and some actual movement in my life. And I didn't really give myself credit for taking these books and taking what they were trying to present to me in any way seriously. I think I thought that I was just going to have fun with them and make fun of them and it would be kind of a quirky, fun little project. But this project, these books have actually been bringing up some pretty real stuff. And I think I figured that out the first episode when I started crying and then when I started crying in like episode number three. And I thought, I don't want this to just turn into my excuse to get on the Internet and be crying every couple days. But I thought all of that emotion, all of that repressed stuff is coming from somewhere. And I really started to think about what the purpose of the renovation was all about. Was it just to sort of fast track some positive change or was it to really sort of get in and dig around in the dirty, murky, shadowy, gross parts of my life that I don't like very much. And so I thought I have to really kind of take this seriously. And I wasn't okay with that at first. And so that's why this episode has taken so long is that I really had to sort of rethink some of what I was planning for the rest of the series. I'm still going to do all the same books. The squad is staying the same, all of that. But I just thought I need to have a different sort of perspective and I need to go into each of these books a different way because I had always anticipated that a couple of the books were probably going to be a little bit more difficult than others. But I hadn't really anticipated that there were going to be this many moments of really just feeling kind of broken apart and feeling like I was digging around in some uncomfortable areas. So that's what's taken so long. That's why we've been away from the renovation, but we're ready to pick up the tools. We're ready to get back at it. And I think that this was the perfect book to do that with. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, But the book that I'm talking about this time is Little Victories, Perfect Rules for Imperfect Living by Jason Gay. This is actually not one that I picked out myself. This is one that I got from a friend. And so I'm going to have a couple of interview questions with her coming up. And we're going to talk a little bit more about where she picked this up and how she chose it. Was it something that was hand selected for me? Something that she really thought would be useful and thought would be helpful? Not so much. Part two, self-care on a budget. So we're talking about the first book that I'm reading that you got me, Little Victories, Perfect Rules for Imperfect Living, which I'm sure you remember very well. Um, How did you pick this book? Oh, yeah. How did I pick that book? It was at the Dollar Tree and you had told me about wanting me to pick out some uh, self-help books. And I just happened to see some self-help books at the Dollar Tree and pick them up with no actual no real thought to what they were about besides that they were a buck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's yeah. self-care on a budget. But I thought that would be very fitting because I'm a Dollar Tree bargain shopper. So let's get you some bargain self-help book. That is true. Hi. 
All right, so this is my dear friend Angela of Beautiful Eccentric. She is a friend that I've had for the last 15 years or so. We met through our shared friend Erica. Erica and I had been really close, and then we went through kind of a friend breakup. And then around the time that we were kind of getting over it, she came in and applied for a job at the Plain Brown Wrapper while I was working there. And Angela came in with her, and so I got to know her through the store. And even after Erica graduated and moved, Angie and I kept being friends and kept hanging out. And she has been such a joyful addition to my life. She's that friend that you can kind of talk about everything with, even if you probably shouldn't be talking about it. Everybody needs that one friend that they can talk about all of the inappropriate, disgusting stuff with. I'm not going to lie, sometimes we talk about bowel movements. She was my maid of honor at my wedding, and she was one of the first people I called when I got divorced. A couple of years ago, I had an anxiety attack. I had never really had one of those before, and I was pretty sure that I was having a heart attack. And she came to the hospital in the middle of the night, even though she had to work early in the morning, and she sat with me to make sure that I was going to be okay. And also, just in case I wasn't, she agreed to be the friend who was going to come over and scrub the house of porn before my mom got there. That's a real friend. So this is my friend Angie, and uh, she is definitely known as being a thrifty bargain shopper. She loves loves going to thrift stores and dollar stores and hunting for a really good bargain. So it absolutely makes sense that she found me a couple of books in the aisles at Dollar Tree. So that one is the one that's by like a usual sports writer guy, right? Yeah. So he was like a sports okay. writer and I think he wrote for Rolling Stone for a while. And Okay. Why are they like little one-liner, two-liner thing, just like thoughts that cross his mind or what have you? Yeah. So it's kind of like this advice okay. book, but it's really kind of... Uh, like, it's a lot of stories from his career and stuff that are mixed in, and so oh, okay. he uses those to kind of give advice. Sounds like a good bathroom reader. That's right. Um, what are you hoping that I get from me this? To give you poo. That's right, since we talk about poop. <laughs> well, and I like to bathroom read. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I do. <laughs> um, okay. What do you hope that I get out of this book? I hope you get entertainment out of it. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> On a bargain basement price. That's right. <laughs> yeah, again, I, I didn't put a whole bunch of thought into it, so there wasn't a whole bunch of, like, help you out with your life kind of thing. It was more like, this might be entertaining for the project you're working on. And that was really the initial plan for the project, was just to kind of read a bunch mm -hmm. of books and make fun of them. And Yeah. Well, and I had, had I not come across those uh, Dollar Tree books before, I think I would have looked into Amazon or something and giving you some suggestions for some self-help books. But since those came around... I was like, this will, this will be my, my, what I give to your project. <laughs> there we go. Well, and this one has turned out to be pretty good. A good little addition to the project. Oh, well, that's good. Very good. I'm so helpful. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. What, what are your thoughts on self-help books in general? I think they can help some people, but unfortunately there are others like me who I'm a little too cynical for them. And I don't know, I like maybe I'll read something and take a little, I could maybe take a little out of self-help books, but majority of the time I'm like, I already know that, I already know that, but am I going to actually put forth the action to change my ways to be that way? Not necessarily, but if I want to, I already know it, you know? <laughs> I feel there are a lot of people who like can be super gullible towards self-help books and they are like their answer and they will try everything on it. And then there are others where it's a little harder to take to heart what is being said in the books. And it's also the way they're presented, you know. I have admittedly not read a lot of self-help books, so <laughs> I don't know. I just view it cynically already where I'm like, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> well, and I think what I struggle with is that I feel like it's hard to just take part of it. I don't know. I get into this all or nothing mindset where the minute something mm -hmm. is like, oh, I think that sounds like bull crap. Then I'm just like, no, it's garbage. I don't need this whole thing instead of like taking the pieces that are useful. Oh, yeah. Like that person is telling you one thing you don't like and you're like, ah, that negates everything else they said. Everything yeah. else they wrote about, screw that. <laughs> yeah, I tend to so do All that. or nothing. So self books. I'm sure I could benefit from them if I wanted to. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't, at this point, I'm not sure if I recommend them because I'm in the middle of an existential crisis because of these goddamn books. So <laughs> it was supposed to be a hearty ha ha laugh laughathon. Look at these, look at these fools telling me stuff, and you're like, ah, oh, shit, this actually hits home. I know. <laughs> Inappropriate. Part 3. The Bait and Switch Alright, so the conceit of this book is that it's an advice book. The subtitle is Perfect Rules for Imperfect Living. In the introduction, he says the advice in this book is both practical and ridiculous. It is neither perfect nor universal. A few years back, I began writing advice rules columns for the Wall Street Journal. Rules of Thanksgiving Family Touch Football, Rules of the Gym, Rules of the Office Holiday Party. The idea was to make a little fun of the cult of advice, the absurd surety of know-it-all experts, and of course, our blossoming era of inane internet lists. 29 ways to watch a sunset with your pony. Ours is a culture that is always telling people what to do. But what do we really know? We're all still learning. Everyone's flawed. Everyone drops their ice cream on the floor, hopes nobody saw it, picks it up, and eats it. Please tell me that's not just me. And so the idea is that he's giving you advice about how to live your life on different sort of categories. It starts with that introduction, little victories, and then goes into topics like hoard your friends, nobody's cool, especially me, health and sickness, look at the stress on him, a brief but hopefully compelling case for marriage, and so on. Now, as I got into this, I started to have a flashback to episode two with that first book that I bought without realizing that it was actually a workbook. And as I was reading this, I realized that I had kind of been bamboozled. This wasn't an advice book, not exactly. Sure, most of the chapters would start with a few little snippets of advice, but overall, what I came to realize is that this was sort of a loosely organized memoir, a chaotic and sort of anti-structural way of presenting stories from his life, stories from his experience. And there'd be a little nugget of advice here in there. And he certainly had some running gags and some jokes that went throughout the chapters, but it focused very intently on some specific milestones in his life, having to do with his marriage, his children, and the illness and eventual death of his father. And while I came to eventually enjoy a lot of what was in this book, I did get a little bit feisty about it. I was having flashbacks, like I said, to Lee Crutchley's How to Be Happy or at Least Less Sad. And I thought, once again, I've been bait and switched. I didn't feel as bad this time because obviously I didn't pick out the book. Angie picked out this book. But I thought, this is a total bait and switch. It's like when you go to the car dealership and they've advertised this really fancy car for a really great price and then you get there and they're like, oh, that one's not available, but let's take a look at this Acura. Nobody wants that fucking Acura, I promise you. That Acura is bullshit and it's probably overpriced. And so it's hard for me to sometimes think of a sort of bait and switch as a positive thing. And so I really kind of had a negative response to this at first, but I kept going with it. I kept reading it. After I gave up on that first book, I was like, I can't keep doing that. I got to get all the way through this book. I got to power through. And there were actually some things about his voice that I found rather endearing. All right, so the following section is from the chapter Travel and Snack Packs. And this is a fairly long quote, but I think it's important. A few years later, I was working at GQ magazine when I came across an item in a newspaper about a man in Minnesota who had discovered he was a Nigerian prince. No, not one of those princes who send an email asking for the routing number to your checking account. This Minnesota guy, whose name was Marty, had been adopted at birth, and in his late 30s, he began looking for his birth parents. He learned that his mother had been a college student in Iowa who had met and fallen in love with a visiting student from Nigeria who had returned to Africa before Marty was born. It took years for Marty to track him down, but it turned out his father was still alive and the chief of a rural village in southeastern Nigeria. This made Marty, a mortgage broker, father of two, basketball coach, a prince. The newspaper story said that Marty hadn't yet been to Africa to visit his dad, and that he was hoping to raise enough money for the trip. I wrote to Marty, explained who I was, and asked him if he ever figured out how to go to Africa, whether I could possibly go along. It must have sounded like such a weird offer. Care to share the most seismic event of your personal life with a random crackpot from a men's fashion magazine? 
Weeks passed. Then one afternoon, I got a clandestine call from Marty's wife. She had raised the money through friends and her church, and they had purchased a round-trip ticket to Lagos, Nigeria. Marty was almost 40 years old, and he was going to find his dad. And they wanted the random crackpot from the men's fashion magazine to go along. And what follows after is the story of him going to Nigeria with this guy and what it was like to meet this guy's father and his new family in Nigeria. And through that, he reflects back on his changing relationship with his own father. And it's not that all of that isn't advice. It's not that there isn't advice or there isn't some sort of life lesson wrapped up in the whole thing. But he's there to tell a story. He's there to tell the story of these experiences. He's recording them and sharing them so that people can hopefully reflect on their own experiences and their own relationships. And perhaps it's a clever way to do that, to sneak it into something that is pretending to be an advice book or a self-help book. Now, there are some chapters that tend to have more of that advice column sort of structure. And these are the ones that tend to be a little bit less serious. There's lots of jokes about how sports fit into kids' lives, about the weird relationships that often emerge at family gatherings, Thanksgiving, and other holidays. But the really poignant and the really important sort of writing that happens in this book happen when he's talking about relationships and specifically when he's talking about his relationship with his father. There's lots of good stuff about relationships and marriage related to his wife and their sort of unconventional courtship, but at its heart, at its most meaningful and its most fully realized, this is a book about a son coming to understand his father while his father is coming to the end of his life. And this is something that really touched me in a way that took me by surprise. I haven't talked about it a lot, and I'm sure it's going to be something that's going to figure into a lot of the later episodes, but I don't really have a relationship with my father. And as I'm getting older and as my mother's getting older, there's also this awareness in the back of my mind that my father is also getting older and that at some point he's going to be reaching the end of his life. And I don't know what our story will look like when we get to that moment. And I don't know how prepared I am to face that sort of situation. And I know that I'm not ready to talk about that relationship yet. I know that seems like a cheap ploy to get you to come back for later episodes of the podcast. But I think that this book starts to chip away at some of that, some of the barriers that I have around that part of my life. And I think that that's why this book, even though it wasn't really what I thought it was going to be, was actually something that had a real resonance for me. And it allowed me to look past some of the quirks of the writing that I'm going to talk about in one of the later chapters. But I think that where this book is the most effective is when he is being a son, when he's just being in relationship to his father and talking about what it's like to reach the end of your life, what it's like to just come to terms with having little victories. It's not about climbing that huge mountain. It's about getting up every day and it's about putting on your shoes and getting dressed and taking a shower. And that's something for somebody with depression that doesn't even have to do with the end of your life necessarily. It just has to do with how you live your life. There are days where it's hard for me to get out of bed. It's hard for me to go to work. It's hard for me to work on any sort of project. And sometimes things around me just go undone because I'm so exhausted and I'm so done in. And I think that that reminder of little victories and how important those can be was something that was really important for me to hear. Part four, under this umbrella, Ella, Ella. So one of the more entertaining parts of the book is a chapter called Nobody's Cool, Especially Me, where Gay talks a lot about what it means to be cool and the value that we place on cool and what that really is all about. And he's talking about when he had a job for Rolling Stone and he was on a private jet to interview Rihanna. And he talks about all the expectations that he had of what it would be like to be on a private jet, to be there talking to Rihanna and getting to know her and interviewing her for this story and how nothing is like what he thought it would be. Rihanna was supposed to do the interview and she kept changing her mind. 
She sat around eating Chinese food and playing on her iPhone, and then she fell asleep. And then her assistant said, well, I'll wake her up about an hour before we get to this refueling stop. And then the assistant fell asleep. And he's getting closer and closer to their refueling stop, which happens to be in Minot, North Dakota. And he's reflecting on what this whole experience has been like. And this is what he says. In this moment, I am the exact opposite of cool. I am sitting in the darkness and I can feel the anxiety vapors lifting off the top of my head. My phone says it's close to 4 a.m., which is roughly our arrival time for our scheduled refueling stop in Minot, North Dakota. I say our scheduled refueling stop, but I really mean their scheduled refueling stop, because as soon as we land, they're dumping me on the tarmac and Rihanna and her gang will fly off to London and I will find a commercial flight to Minneapolis. And so I am panicking. I fear failure and I have a job to do. And so I get up, my neck scrunched, and find Rihanna's assistant sleeping in her seat. She startles and whispers that she will do what she can. A short while later, she returns and says, Rihanna will see me now. I'm making this sound like I'm sitting at the end of a long hallway. Rihanna is barely 10 feet away, now sitting up in her bed. I move forward down the aisle and prop myself on the bed. I have interviewed a few people on airplanes, and I have learned that it is important to get physically close to them. So I am getting close, leaning forward across the covers. Rihanna is lying back on the pillows, expressionless. I look like I'm going to read her a story in bed. I look like I'm going to read Rihanna, Good Night Moon. And that exploration of what it means to be cool and what our expectations of cool are all about, I think it really gets to the heart of why this book is the way that it is. That story, that antithesis of cool, is in its own way cool because that's his experience, being able to say, I was on a plane with Rihanna. And we all have those weird moments, and even if they're not with celebrities, even if they're not at these big historical moments, we all have those moments moments that mean something to us. They're the fabric of who we are and how we came to be the people that we are. And so they're not cool because they include a brand name or a certain location. They're cool because they make up the foundation of our personality. They make up the foundation of who we are. They give us meaning and they give us texture. And when we're gone, those stories might linger with a few people who knew us or who were there, and eventually they disappear. And maybe you can work them into a book. Maybe you can include them as anecdotes into a self-help slash memoir slash slippery little book that isn't easily categorized that ends up on a shelf in a Dollar Tree in Grand Forks, North Dakota, that gets picked up by a shrewd bargain hunter who gives it to her friend, the neurotic drag queen who's going through a midlife crisis, and she reads it, and she gets on a podcast, and she tells the story again, and the story continues to live, and it continues to have meaning, and it continues to resonate, and it all comes out of that moment, and it's a moment that's not cool, but it's something better, more real. And isn't that why we tell our stories in the first place? Because we want to be remembered. We want the things in our life to have mattered. And that meaning is so much more important, whether it's to one person or to a billion people. It's so much more important than just being cool. When the love has took its part, when the world has dealt its cards, if the hand is hard together will mend your heart. Part 5. Enter the English Major People who write enough, especially if they write for a living, tend to develop a specific style. And even if you really enjoy a writer, sometimes there will be things about that style that grow to annoy you. Now, we've been having our share of Hallmark moments during this podcast, but now is the point in the broadcast where I get just a little bit petty. Like Queen Petty. 
You can be a heartbreaker and you call me Tom Petty. There were some things with Jason Gay's style that really started to get on my nerves. And it was actually something that reminded me of one of my favorite writers, which is actually Stephen King, who writes something very different than what I was reading in Little Victories. But they have something in their style that was very similar, and it drove me up the wall. And that was the way that he used repetition. Now, this is something that when you're writing an article can work really well in that short form. Having a kind of joke or gag line that repeats maybe two, three times during the article can help tie it together. I use that device sometimes in my own writing. But when you translate it to the long form, sometimes it gets a little bit repetitious. It just starts to drag a little bit. And Jason Gay used this a lot. There was one example where a piece of his advice was, don't serve soup at a dinner party. And he kept returning back to it like, no, seriously, don't have soup. Everybody will be mad, they'll still feel hungry, and they're not sure why they came to this party. And then he talks about chili, and he's like, I know that I said not to serve soup at a dinner party, but if it's chili, you could maybe get away with it. But maybe don't try it, because you're serving soup at a dinner party. Like, it just, it kept going and going and going. And it just felt like he was trying really hard to be very Baz Luhrmann, wear sunscreen. But it just wasn't getting there. And I know that that's super petty, and I know that I'm just trying to distract myself from having emotions, but it was something that just kept coming up, especially in the chapters that weren't as focused on the more poignant or more emotional parts of his story. And so when he was trying to be a little bit more lighthearted, a little bit more humorous, there was a lot of reliance on that specific device. And that's something that Stephen King does a lot, and it's something that has always annoyed me about his writing, is that he will have a character make some sort of little joke early on in the book will come up with some sort of nickname for another character or there will be a specific kind of joke or maybe they'll have a little bit of rhyming language or something and he will repeat that over and over and over ad nauseum throughout the book and it's one of the things of Stephen King's style that absolutely drives me crazy and so when I saw it happening here it started to kind of annoy me a little bit. I think that other than that the style of this was really interesting to me. I liked that it was a book that didn't really fit into an easily identified sort of classification because it's kind kind of a self-help book. It's kind of a memoir. And as Angie mentioned, it's kind of a bathroom reader. There are some chapters where it's just little short pieces of advice. And so I appreciated that there was that slipperiness to what it was. I think that it's interesting that he chose to approach it in that way. And I'm also interested as to why he didn't focus on writing something like a memoir, why he didn't write the book about his relationship with his father. Now, before we leave this section that's just a little bit petty, I have to revisit something that I did earlier in the episode that has been absolutely driving me crazy. And that's a word that I said, and I'm not sure that I said it correctly. And honestly, for the entire time that I've been recording the rest of this episode, all I can think about is that one damn word. Because I'm almost positive that I said it wrong. And it was in the story about the man who went to Africa to meet his father. And I was reading a quote from the book, and he talks about how he got a clandestine phone call from the man's wife. And I'm pretty sure that that word is said clandestine. But there was something about clandestine phone call that just didn't sound right in my brain. And I said clandestine, and now all I can think about is the word clandestine because I don't think that's a real word. I think it's clandestine. And the petty English major in me needs to know, even if I'm trolling myself. So we're going to pull up dictionary.com and we're going to have it pronounce it for us. Hold on. Clandestine. Clandestine. Well, there you have it. Even as I'm trolling Jason Gay for his use of repetition, I can't even say the word clandestine. We live in a world where we love to troll and we love to feed the trolls. And that reminds me of one other piece that Jason Gay included in his book, a piece of advice that I think is really useful. He's talking about how he responds to particularly ugly comments online. And here's what he says. A few times when I've received some particularly hateful comments from people, I've taken the time to reach out to them via email, and a couple of times phone calls, and say hello. And I mean, hello. I'm not trying to be confrontational. I simply say who I am, and say I read what they wrote, and say I regret their disappointment. The reaction is almost always surprise and backpedaling. You can hear the smoke screeching off their tires. Then the apologies commence. 
I don't need an apology. I just think a lot of people view the internet as this place where rudeness doesn't stick, where the usual decorum of human interaction isn't necessary, and even the most incendiary language isn't really real. I think it's useful to remind people every once in a while that it's real. It's also kind of fun. So hopefully Jason Gay, if he ever hears this, isn't too offended by my critique of his work. And if he is, he's welcome to call me anytime. Part 6. What I Didn't Know I Needed I'll be honest. I put this book where I did in the series because it was supposed to be a distraction. I figured I would have the saucy millennial style of you are a badass and then go deep on relationships with how to be single and happy. And I really expected that that book by Jennifer Tates would be the one that would cause me a little bit of a breakdown. So I thought, let's put the funny dollar store book right after that one. Now, as it turns out, if you've already listened to the episode about you are a badass, that one actually got pretty emotional and nobody was more surprised than me to see that How to Be Single and Happy by Jennifer Tates was actually pretty useful and I didn't have the sort of emotional response that I expected. And so this book was supposed to be a little bit of a throwaway, a little bit of poking fun at the type of books you find in the Dollar Tree. I didn't expect that there would be so much in here that would have me looking to future episodes of this series where I'm going to have to dig in and deal with my relationship with my father. And I think that if I'm really honest, if I'm really open, I I think that that relationship is at the heart of my struggles with mental health and depression. And I think it's at the heart of why I started this project in the first place. And reading this kind of silly, kind of goofy, kind of all over the place book about Jason Gay and his relationship with his father and the experience of losing his father actually helped to kind of refocus me. In the final chapter, he's talking about his dad's death. And he talks about the relationship between a father and a son. And he says, father and son is a complicated relationship, certainly by nature, probably by design. So much is given and expected to the point that it's hard to live up to any of it. The relationship is almost all emotion, no professional distance, little perspective. My dad, like almost every dad, had his episodes as mentor, adversary, advocate, and tyrant. He could be thoughtful and tender, but also fly off the handle unnecessarily cartoonishly, freak out when freaking out was not the right thing. I spent way too much time being ungrateful and mad. We argued into my adulthood. As I got older, it got better. Parenthood softened me, grandparenthood softened him. Plus he was good at it, a full on babbling, googly woogly granddad, sticking a tennis racket in Jesse's hand before he could crawl, showing Jesse the same summer constellations he had showed me when I was Jesse's age. Nothing makes you love a parent more than seeing their love for your own kid. And I think that I'm really struggling with how to process my feelings about my father and my relationship with my father and what it means that we're all getting older and our time is limited. And it really sort of makes my heart stiffen a bit when Jason Gay writes, this is the part where I beg, don't wait because I'm not going to have any children. There's not gonna be any grandchildren to help bridge the distance between us. And I'm still trying to figure out if I even want that distance bridged at all. And I still have so much anger at him. I recently reconnected with one of the aunts on my dad's side of the family. And I remember the first time that we got together, we were talking and she was giving me some updates on different members of the family. And she showed me some pictures of these beautiful quilts. And she was telling me that one of the hobbies that my dad has taken up as he's gotten older is quilting. And as I was looking at the pictures, I was so angry and it was so hard for me to stay engaged in that interaction because I thought that's not the person that I got to know. I didn't get to know the person who can be quiet and focus on something as intricate as sewing together pieces of fabric and making a quilt. That's not the experience that I had. And I didn't know how to put those things together. And I didn't know how to take those different images of this person that I barely knew and make meaning out of it. And I think that that conflict is at the heart of what I'm trying to do with the renovation. I think that 
this project is about repairing the damage that was done to me by that relationship and trying to figure out what it means to live in a world after after that relationship has the hold over me that it does now after i find a way to rebuild my concept of myself away from that relationship and who am i going to be and how am i going to find my way there and i think that there was a moment where i started to see that possibility at the very end the way that jason gay closes the book he says i'm going to make so many mistakes but i know it is okay i'll take small steps marginal improvements little victories Part 7. The King and I So the person who read the opening quote for this episode actually agreed to do it about five minutes before we actually recorded. I initially had somebody else scheduled to read the opening quote for this episode. And as happens, especially when you're doing creative work and it's all on a volunteer basis, life just got a little crazy and they just didn't have time. And so I was able to shift them to a later episode because I still am very excited to have them be part of the process and to be part of the series. But I needed somebody to open up this episode. There is a drag performer that I've known for about a decade, and his name is BJ Armani. BJ is a performer who got his start in the shows that I used to host in the basement bar of the Highlander Lounge way back in the day. And now he is hosting and putting on his own shows, BJ Armani's Cabaret, and is using his platform to raise money for various charities across the Red River Valley. I was very excited that he agreed to be part of the podcast. And even though everybody likes to imagine that there's a ton of beef between the two of us, I'm also glad to call him my friend. So thank you to BJ Armani for being a last minute replacement and becoming part of Miss J, The Renovation. Miss J, The Renovation is a 17 episode limited series podcast presented by Champagne Dreams Productions. While we're all here to have fun, mental health is a serious issue. Nothing in this podcast series should be taken as medical advice, and listening to podcasts or reading self-help books is not a substitute for proper mental health care. If you or someone you know is considering suicide, please contact the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 or visit suicidepreventionhotline.org for more information. I love all of my champagne dreamers out there. Stay safe and stay alive. This episode of Miss J the Renovation includes royalty-free music from bensound.com. Included in this episode are the following tracks. Clear Day, Enigmatic, Happiness, Fun Day, November, Sexy, and Summer. For these and more great royalty-free tracks, visit bensound, that's B-E-N sound.com. This episode also features audio by Fulia Elena, who did that beautiful acoustic cover of Rihanna's Umbrella. Her name is spelled F-U-L-Y-A-A-L-E-Y-N-A, and you can find her music on youtube.com. Miss J, The Renovation is written and directed by Chris M. Stoner and is a Champagne Dreams production.